Welcome back to Chapter 10, Section 2, Biotechnology in Medicine and Agriculture. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe the uses of biotechnology in medicine, or at least the surface thereof, describe the uses of biotechnology in agriculture. It is easy to see how biotechnology can be used for medicinal purposes. Knowledge of the genetic makeup of our species, the genetic basis of heritable diseases, and the invention of technology to manipulate and fix mutant genes provides methods to treat diseases. Biotechnology in agriculture can enhance resistance to disease, pests, and environmental stress to improve both crop yield and quality. Genetic Diagnosis and Gene Therapy the process of testing for suspected genetic defects before administering treatment is called genetic diagnosis by genetic testing. In some cases in which a genetic disease is present in an individual's family, family members may be advised to undergo genetic testing. For example, mutations in the BRCA genes may increase the likelihood of developing breast and ovarian cancers in women and some other cancers in women and men. A woman with breast cancer can be screened for these mutations. If one of the high-risk mutations is found, her female relatives may also wish to be screened for that particular mutation or simply be more vigilant for the occurrence of cancers. Genetic testing is also offered for fetuses or embryos with in vitro fertilization to determine the presence or absence of disease-causing genes in families with specific debilitating diseases. Here is an example of that in, the, in California. The California Department of Public Health has a newborn screening program. And again, with the BRCA alleles, the presence or absence of a particular BRCA allele may affect the uh, therapy choices. Generally, with uh, whether or not to get a mastectomy, mastectomy, hysterectomy, Gene therapy is a genetic engineering technique that may one day be used to cure certain genetic diseases. In its simplest form, it involves the introduction of a non-mutated gene at a random location in the genome to cure a disease by replacing a protein that may be absent in the individuals because of a genetic mutation. The non-mutated gene is usually introduced into disease cells as a part of a vector transmitted by a virus, such as adenovirus, that can infect the host cell and deliver the foreign DNA into the genome of the targeted cell. That is depicted in this figure here. So the vector will use, so in this case we're talking about adenovirus that has been modified with a new gene with a flanking viral DNA. It uses the features on the viral capsid to bind with the host cell uh, triggering the cell to engulf it by phagocytosis where it can be, uh, where it can deliver. Using viral processes, it can deliver an altered payload to the nucleus. To date, gene therapies have been primarily experimental procedures in humans. A few of these experimental treatments have been successful, but the methods may be important in the future as the factors limiting its success are resolved. Here's another divergence from the textbook here to go over this a little bit more. So up through 2014, here's an idea of how many gene therapy clinical trials have been approved. And mostly these therapies are for cancer, but then there are a number of other diseases that have research attempts underway currently. And the phases that they're in a quick description of the phases of a clinical trial here. So a phase one clinical trial is a very small study that involves a small group and the target is to assay the safety of the therapy. So here the majority are in phase one. Phase two clinical trials is the point where it's moved on to testing efficacy, again in a very small group. Phase three is where you work to introduce, where it's ethically viable, a randomized treatment protocol, where you seek to have a treatment group that is blinded. So you have a portion of the group that receives the therapy and a portion that does not, and they don't know what they got. 
in order to um, more robustly test the efficacy that you found in your phase two trial. And then if it passes phase three, we reach phase four. So there's two of these out there currently in phase four, where uh, this is called the post-marketing surveillance trials. This is where you deploy the therapy to uh, likely candidates that can benefit from it, and then you monitor them. You, you keep up with them and see if it's uh, working or if a problem arises, you can address it. So the vectors that are being used in these gene therapy approaches include a variety of viruses. So adenovirus, as mentioned in the textbook, makes up a large component, but there's also some other retroviruses. There are attempts to use naked or plasmid DNA and a variety of other viruses, including the pox virus, the herpes virus, and uh, viruses that are related to HIV, and then, you know, some other vectors. Production of vaccines, antibiotics, and hormones. Traditional vaccination strategies use weakened or inactivated forms of microorganisms or viruses to stimulate the immune system. Modern techniques use specific genes of microorganisms cloned into vectors and mass-produced in bacteria to make large quantities of specific substances to stimulate the immune system. The substance is then used as a vaccine. In some cases, such as the H1N1 flu vaccine, genes cloned from the virus have been used to combat the constantly changing strains of this virus. Antibiotics kill bacteria and are naturally produced by microorganisms such as fungi. Penicillin is perhaps the most well-known example. Antibiotics are produced on a large scale by cultivating and manipulating fungal cells. The fungal cells have typically been genetically modified to improve the yields of the antibiotic compound. Recombinant DNA technology was used to produce large-scale quantities of the human hormone insulin in Escherichia coli as early as 1978. Now, this is before PCR was invented. Previously, it was only possible to treat diabetes with pig insulin, which caused allergic reactions in many humans because of differences in the insulin molecule. In addition, human growth hormone, HGH, is used to treat growth disorders in children. The HGH gene was cloned from a cDNA, complementary DNA, library and inserted into Escherichia coli cells by cloning it into a bacterial vector, as explained before. Transgenic animals. Although several recombinant proteins used in medicine are successfully produced in bacteria, some proteins need a eukaryotic animal host for proper processing. For this reason, genes have been cloned and expressed in animals such as sheep, goats, chickens, and mice. Animals that have been modified to express recombinant DNA are called transgenic animals. And in this picture, you have two mice that are transgenic. They have the gene that causes them to fluoresce under a UV light, most likely originally came uh, from the jellyfish. The non-transgenic mouse does not have the gene and therefore does not fluoresce. That's all that is about. You can also buy, uh, currently, right now, you can buy glowfish. And some Walmarts sell these, or you can buy them online. These are mostly zebra fish, uh, but now they have some other species available in different colors that you can buy that have these, uh, they're transgenic fish. Several human proteins are expressed in the milk of transgenic sheep and goats. One was the spider goat, right? And those goats, that experiment didn't work out. Uh, those goats are still alive and there's still a breeding program to keep them all, keep them going. But the biosteel polymer hasn't happened so much. In one commercial example, the FDA has approved a blood anticoagulant protein that is produced in the milk of transgenic goats for use in humans. Mice have been used extensively for expressing and studying the effects of recombinant genes and mutations. Right, so this is the goat thing I was mentioning. This is dragline one, uh, the dragline one gene from the golden orb weaver. And uh, this didn't, this failed commercially, but there's still a breeding program at Utah State University. And last time I checked, it was still there around, and that was just a few months ago. Transgenic plants. Manipulating the DNA of plants, 
creating genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, has helped create desirable traits such as disease resistance, herbicide and pest resistance, better nutritional value, and better shelf life. Plants are the most important source of food for the human population. Farmers developed ways to select for plant varieties with desirable traits long before modern-day biotechnology practices were established. Transgenic plants have received DNA from other species. Because they contain unique combinations of genes and are not restricted to the laboratory, transgenic plants and other GMOs are closely monitored by government agencies to ensure that they are fit for human consumption and do not endanger other plants and animal life. Because foreign genes can spread to other species in the environment, particularly in the pollen and seeds of plants, extensive testing is required to ensure ecological stability. Staples like corn, potatoes, and tomatoes were the first crop plants to be genetically engineered. So on average, it's uh, 13 to 15 years of testing, and the genetically modified organisms, uh, the crop cultivars that are available, have been extensively tested. The, the volume, the sheer volume of literature on all aspects of these organisms is, uh, is amazing. Transformation of plants using Agrobacterium tumefaciens. In plants, tumors, or galls, caused by the bacterium Agrobacterium tumefaciens occur by transfer of DNA from the bacterium to the plant. The artificial introduction of DNA into plant cells is more challenging than in animal cells because of the thick plant cell walls. Researchers used the natural transfer of DNA from agrobacterium to a plant host to introduce DNA fragments of their choice into plant hosts. In nature, the disease-causing agrobacterium have a set of plasmids that contain genes that integrate into the infected plant cell's genome. Researchers manipulate the plasmids to carry the desired DNA fragments and insert it into the plant genome. The organic insecticide Bacillus thuringiensis. Bacillus thuringiensis, also known as Bt, is a bacterium that produces protein crystals, the cry toxin, the CRY toxin, that are toxic to many insect species that feed on plants. Insects that have eaten Bt toxin stop feeding on the plants within a few hours. After the toxin is activated in the intestines of the insects, death occurs within a couple of days. The crystal toxin genes have been cloned from the bacterium and introduced into plants, therefore allowing plants to produce their own crystal Bt toxin that acts against insects. Bt toxin is safe for the environment and non-toxic to mammals, including humans. As a result, it has been approved for use by organic farmers as a natural insecticide. There is some concern, however, that insects may evolve resistance to the Bt toxin in the same way that bacteria evolve resistance to antibiotics. Flavor Saver Tomato The first GM crop to be introduced into the market was the Flavor Saver Tomato produced in 1994. Molecular genetic technology was used to slow down the process of softening and rotting caused by fungal infections, which led to increased shelf life of the GMO tomatoes. It failed in the market, however, because of... That's a funny movie, by the way. No, not at all. Um, additional genetic modification improved the flavor of this tomato. The Flavor Saver tomato did not successfully stay in the market because of problems maintaining and shipping the crop. No killer tomato attack, sorry. Another product that's out there that Canadians are currently enjoying is the Aqua Advantage Salmon. So these are salmon that have been modified to be able to grow to uh, see much larger. So farmed salmon, both these fish are 18 months old. You have a, you know, a much larger fish that's ready to go to market inside of 18 months, Aqua Advantage Salmon. This is not yet approved for consumption in the United States. One new GMO that is approved for consumption in the United States is the Arctic apple. These are non-browning apples. That uh, So conventional apples, they have this enzyme, this PPO enzyme, that turns them brown. And in the Arctic apple, the uh, capacity to make that enzyme is gone. So when you make the slices, so like when McDonald's packages the sliced apples, I don't know, there's something in there that keeps them from browning, right? 
Um, I don't know what it is. If you use these Arctic apples, you don't need to do that. You can leave apple slices out for a lot longer because they will not brown. There's also the question of lab-grown meat. Uh, this isn't quite ready for prime time. So this is muscle tissue essentially grown outside of a body. And, uh, you know, this first one apparently costs like $130,000 to be able to make this much of it. Hopefully this will reach the commercial market. Meanwhile, you have the Impossible Burger, which is based on a genetically modified yeast, expressing a, a hemoglobin-like molecule that came from soybeans that allows it to taste a uh, very meaty. There's a second version that's just come out. I haven't tried yet. I tried the first one and I found it quite tasty. That brings us to the end of section two. Join me next time for section three, genomics and proteomics. Until then.